key of the worshipers. Wow, for those that were in the service this morning, we know that the anointing was flowing, yes? I was sitting there filled and the songs came and every prayer, I'm not going to sing, I'm not a singer, I know my lane. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship is to our God. I was getting excited. I'm like, oh, Lord, you're hitting my topic. Thank you, Jesus. And then we got into I expect a miracle. So I'm like, oh, yes, Lord, you're going to perform a miracle. The fact that I'm standing here is a miracle. So I was getting more excited. And then we went into we worship you, God. We give you all the glory. And that is one of my points. So I believe that even then, God was speaking to me, and um, I know that God is awesome, and my topic is a lifestyle of praise, and as I sat there and worshiped, God said to me, this is how it could be if everybody adapted a lifestyle of praise, amen? So my topic today, for those who are taking notes, is... A lifestyle of praise. My points are one, pray always, two, praise at midnight, and three, power of worship. Amen. So we'll do a little bit of background on the scripture that was so read tonight in your hearing, and it concerns a young lady who was possessed by a spirit. She was able to tell fortunes, and she was going around declaring it the truth about Paul and his company. She was saying, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they show us the way of salvation. But, there's that but, there were men that controlled her, and they were making a lot of money out of her fortune telling. In those days, people had a strange kind of respect for those who to fortunes, kind of like prophets today, but I'm going to move on. <laughs> People knew her talents, and they would listen to whatever she was saying. So when she was talking about Paul and Silas, about these men are servants of the Most High God, people were at attention. But it grieved Paul, and he didn't want nothing to do with that. So he stopped, and he... He removed that spirit that was in her. Now, you would think this is a good thing. It's a good thing, yes? But not everybody was happy. Not everybody was happy. The man was upset, those that were profiting from her. And they decided, they decided that they were going to put Paul and Silas in jail. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Now, I looked at how do we pray, because my first point is pray always. Let's think a minute about how we pray and how we talk to God. Usually prayers are mostly give me, give me, give me. Sounds a bit harsh, right? Well, let me give you a few examples. Lord, I need a parking space, please. Please let there be one for me so I won't have to circle the block. Lord, I need to pass this test. Bring everything to my remembrance. I know I was praying that with the Bible quiz. Hallelujah. <laughs> what about, Lord, I need a job. Lord, I need a financial blessing. Lord, my bills are due, my mortgage is due, and the list goes on and on. Doesn't that sound like, Lord, give me, give me? And some of us have the nerve to bargain with God. Wow, God, if you get me through this, I will do this. Or Lord, just bless me one more time and I promise. Does any of that sound familiar? Don't you often wish that every prayer that we pray will be answered right away? Wouldn't that be nice? One stretch of faith, though instead of the weight signal that comes from heaven. In Psalm 27, 14, it says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So we know by that scripture verse, it says to wait 
And here's the interesting part, be of good courage. We wait, but we know we're not of good courage. Let's keep it real, we're in charge, so you're not supposed to lie. Okay, we are not of good courage. We wait and we murmur and complain. We would need to have God's wisdom to go along with it if he granted us our prayers every day. So it's a good thing God says no to some things and wait for others because he knows what's best for us. And saints, we shouldn't mind waiting. Why? Because we know that God's timing is perfect. One thing I do know is that when I don't pray, I'm left to handle things on my own power without divine intervention. And that's not always a good thing. A lot of us go there. We do that. We say, okay, I'm going to do this and this. And when we get in a mess, we ask God to please help us to fix it instead of going to him in the first place. Sometimes the mere timing of the answer is a miracle in itself to show that it truly came from God and not something of our own power. God loves to delight his children, and he loves to do things in such a way that he gets all the glory. Amen? Just imagine if each one of us understood the power of prayer and practiced it every day. Not only will people's lives change, but the whole world will change. Why? Because we know that prayer works. There is, of course, nothing wrong with taking all our needs to the Lord. In fact, in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. But this can become a problem for us if that's all we do. Anyone's faith can work on a good day. But, there's that but, when the chips are done, do you have that mustard seed faith? When the chips are done, people will know whether or not your faith is real. And trust me, they are watching you closely. Will you be able to rejoice in a difficult hour? Say, for instance, when there's a sudden death in the family. Say, for instance, when you go to the doctor and you hear bad news, health issues hit you up from nowhere, can you still rejoice? Can you? I submit that we can because we know that God is real. We know that God is a keeper. We know that God is a way maker. And we know God's word is true. So we stand on God's word no matter what is going on in our lives. Which brings me to point number one, pray always. In Acts 16, 22, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them in the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. We look at this story and say, oh, man, that was terrible. These preachers didn't deserve it. They didn't do anything. Like, what kind of treatment is that? They didn't deserve to be beaten, severely flogged, and thrown into prison. It's one thing to say you're going to prison, but then they've got to beat you up before you go. No chance of escape because their feet was made fast in stocks. Now, if any two people had a reason to whine and complain, it would be Paul and Silas. They were thrown in a Philippian prison because they had cast a demon out of a girl. That was a good thing, right? The prison back then was nowhere like the prison in Bermuda. I am sure they did not allow them to bathe, put on clean clothes, we know that they weren't allowed to move freely because their feet were in stock and their hands. So they didn't allow them to go to the bathroom. They didn't allow them to have visitors. The Bible says they were beaten. I imagine, I try to put myself there, that if your arms and your legs are mobile, obviously you're gonna get cramps. You're gonna get a loss of circulation. And all of this while 
not just in prison, they were in an inner prison. The atmosphere was depressing. According to the standards of that day, a prison was more like a dungeon, a dark, damp place. They didn't have no facility for waste or comforts of any kind. I imagine the smiles that were coming from the jail. And yes, they did not warrant that type of treatment, nor was it fair, considering what they were accused of. But, saints, Satan isn't in the business of treating people fairly. He does his job to perfection. His, try, his business is trying to kill, steal, and destroy the works of Christ and his church. And he does everything possible to prevent the gospel from going forth. He just doesn't do it with Paul and Silas, you know. He does it with us too, if we allow it. Yet in spite of all the pain in their bodies, the depressing atmosphere, at midnight, Paul and Silas were heard praying and singing praises to God. And I thought, wow, if I have a little ache and pain, I'm miserable. <laughs> so I have to press, I'm being honest, transparent. I have to press sometimes because I don't feel like it. But it's not about what we feel. You ever wonder what they were praying for? It could have been, I can't take it anymore. It could have been, Lord, I need a breakthrough. I do know that they were Christians. They came together on one accord, interceding in Jesus' name, which I believe Christians and the church were united in praying for them. And so it should be. Don't we agree with that? We should unite in prayer and be on one accord. So let me ask you this. Do we unite in prayer for seven minutes on a Tuesday, as pastor requested? Or do we often forget? Do we come out early on a Wednesday night for 15 minutes of prayer before Bible study to intercede? You ain't got to tell me this between you and God. Amen? I'm not sure why the Bible states midnight, but it does. Maybe it, be, it was because another day was approaching. And Paul and Silas had had enough of the surroundings. They were sick and tired. I don't know. The Bible didn't say. Maybe desperation had set in. We've got to do something. Obviously, they knew that sitting there moaning and groaning about how uncomfortable they were and how the conditions would do them no good. They knew it was unfair, but they knew they had to do something. Amen? It wouldn't help either of them feel any better if they just stayed in there and did the woe is me. You know when we do the woe is me, we try to get other people on board. <laughs> they were Christians, but they were human. So, let me ask you a question. When you go through your midnight experience, do you murmur and complain about how unfair life is? A lot of times we don't deserve it. Or do we talk to anyone who would listen about how we're going through? Or do we take a page out of Paul and Silas' book and start praising and worshiping God? You don't have to wait until your midnight experiences come. You can do that at any time. Paul and Silas, as I said, they could have complained constantly because they really had been about God's business. That's what got them in the mess in the first place. How often do we think, Lord, I don't know why these things are happening to me. I ain't done nothing wrong. I give my tithe, I do everything according to why is it happening to me? Well, look at Job. Things happened to him, and he was a righteous man. So why not you? We often sing the words to the song by Tasha Cobbs, For your glory, I will do anything 
just to see you, to behold you as my king. Lord, if I find favor in your sight. So when God takes us to unfamiliar places, hard, uncomfortable places, often is to get our attention. So why do we grumble? Interesting. One minute, Paul and Silas were casting out a demon. The next minute, they were sitting in jail. But it was all a part of God's sovereign plan. Sometimes our lives have to be completely shaken up, changed, and rearranged to get us to a place where God wants us to be. Let's pray without ceasing. Amen? You'll get home early tonight. A <laughs> second point is midnight praise. Verse 25, it says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and they sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. The prisoners were listening. No matter what time of day we can praise God, even if it's in the midnight hour, that is reassuring and a great reminder to us. Also, be aware that the prisoners or the people are always listening. People around us are always watching and listening. And being at Shekinah, you're highlighted on TV. I've had people who don't know my name but call me Miss Shekinah. You know that they're looking, and you know that they're listening. I tell this little joke here, and it's true, and I'll share it with you. Um, I was walking through the park one day, um, just walking through the park. Is it Victoria Park? Anyway, I was walking through a park. And I was walking, minding my own business, and on the side were some gentlemen, as they always are, you know. And they said, hello. And I'm like, oh, Lord, they ain't talking to me. And I kept walking. I said, <coughs> hello. <laughs> so I'm turning and said, good afternoon. How are you? Oh, I know you. I said, okay, Lord, help me out here. <laughs> so they said, I saw you on TV, Shakina. <laughs> so I said, okay, praise the Lord. Next time I hope to see you in church. <laughs> but the point is the watching. And your witness is important, even to those that you don't think are looking. Amen? We are the church, and we have to represent God. Now, let's get back to our text. At the midnight hour, everything looked hopeless. They didn't call the lawyers to get them out of jail. They didn't get a committee together to discuss how they could go about freeing them. They prayed and they sang praises unto God. And then there was a whole lot of shaking going on. Saints, don't be afraid or upset with the shake up. Shake up. It is necessary for God to do a thing within us. I believe at midnight, Paul and Silas were saying, Now look, we got to do something here. I'm not going another day in this. I believe their faith was elevated, and so was the praise. I imagine them singing songs of today, because I don't know what they would have sang back then. They sang songs like, God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide, walking close beside my side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way for me. And then I imagine them singing late in the midnight hour. God's going to turn it around. He's going to work in my favor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then I thought about one of my favorite hymns. I'm sure they broke it down to say, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Saints, these type of songs can get you through your midnight situations. Amen? 
the Bible says that suddenly there was a great earthquake. So we know that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, not an hour or two later, immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. That means Paul and Silas and all the prisoners. Imagine for a minute if your midnight prayers brought about release, hallelujah, for friends and family that you have been praying for. No more shackles, no more chains, freedom. Saints, when is your suddenly moment? What does it take for you, your foundation, sorry, to shake? What will it take? Think about it. And it, does, it just doesn't affect you. Amen? The Bible says they began praying and singing praises to God. In the midst of their pain, they sang praises. In the midst of their agony, they sang praises. In the midst of the darkness, they sang praises. In their midnight hour, they sang praises. They sang praises in spite of their feelings, in spite of their circumstances, in spite of uncomfortable distress conditions. And as they praise, God magnified himself. An earthquake came and the shackles and chains, the prisoners were free. When we get our mind of ourselves and our circumstances unto God and his greatness and begin praising him with our whole heart, we are loosed and set free. The chains of doubt Fear, confusion, all are broken. What about the chains of depression, pride, pettiness, greed, unforgiveness are broken. And we are set free by the power of our praise. That's why I always like to say, don't stop praising God. Don't stop praising God because when you praise... Praise break chains if you don't let your chains break your praise. Amen? Amen? Praise break chains if you don't let your chains break your praise. So let's talk about praise. What is praise? Praise means to command, to applaud, or magnify. For the Christian, praising God is an expression of worship. Lifting up. Glorifying God, it's an expression of humbling ourselves and centering our attention upon God with adoration and thanksgiving. Praise elevates us into God's presence. Paul and Silas knew the secret of how to lift their hearts above their situation and enter into God's presence and power. They knew that only God could help them through their circumstances. They knew that praise would open doors. I'm sure this wasn't the first time they were praising. I'm sure they had been in similar circumstances before where only God delivered them through their praise. Have you ever had circumstances in your life that you knew only God could help you? Now, let's talk about praise. This came to me this afternoon. Praise is different depending on what you go through. Amen? If God's brought you through the week, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I made it till Friday. God is good. If God prevented you from getting a parking ticket, ooh, glory, he lifted up a notch or two. What about if you go to the doctor and get a report? You're praising, you're believing. You go through the procedures because we know that God puts in the doctors what to do. And you get a report that it's no more cancer. You know your prayers is elevated. Hallelujah! You're going from... Oh, thank you, Lord, for the week to hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise is different depending on your circumstances. And if you're not there, keep on praising him. 
God chooses what we go through, but we choose how we go through it. Thank you, God. God will not hold back his goodness. As we praise, it opens the gateway of blessings, and we come into the presence of King. As the song said, as the blessings go up, what happens? The praises. As the praises go up, the blessings come down. Amen, amen. The Bible says in Psalm 22, 3, that God inhabits the praises of his people. In other words, God dwells in the atmosphere of his praise. This means praise is a vehicle of faith, which brings us into the presence and power of God. I like to think of praise and worship are gate paths, which allows us to enter into the holy of holiness. Have you ever noticed that God begins to bless and move amongst us after we begin to worship and praise him? Wasn't it a witness today in church? Yes, indeed. Some think that worship is a response after the Holy Spirit moves, but it's the other way around. God's presence responds when we move upon him with worship. Bishop Paul Morton has a song, Let All My Worship Flow to You. You know that song? That is so healing for me because it tells me that when I think of flow, I think of a river, it's constant. It just doesn't flow for a little bit and stop. This is constant. So let your worship be constant and flow to God, yes? Let the river of my worship, I'm making it personal, flow to you. Lift up Jesus through praise and worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise connects us to the power of God. Amen? Amen. Let's talk about the power of worship. There are many actions involved with praise and worship to God. There's verbal expressions of adoration, thanksgiving, singing, playing instruments, shouting, running, dancing, lifting or clapping our hands. But true praise is not merely going through these motions. Jesus spoke about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees whose worship was only an outward show and not from the heart. Is that how we worship God? Is that how we worship God from the outside? Matthew 15, 8. This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. According to scripture, expressions of praise brings blessings of the Lord. And he eagerly awaits the sweet smelling fragrance of our worship so that he can lovingly show us his sweet presence. In John 4, 23, it says, the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Unfortunately, some people think praise is something that only takes place in church. However, praise should be a part of a Christian's lifestyle. Daily prayer life, at work, in the car, when you're looking for that parking space, at home, when we're cooking, when we're cleaning, anywhere. Praise God whether you're on the mountaintop, God is there. Praise him when you're in your valley experiences, God is there. You praise through trials and temptations, for God is there. I know some of us, some of us, feel that it's really a sacrifice to offer praise and worship. Some of us don't feel like it. Some of us struggle. We get tired. Some of us feel, nobody here, of course, but some of us feel that God has let us down. We think 
God is so far away. How could he possibly understand what I'm going through? Or we may even think, does he really care about what's troubling me? If he did, why is he taking so long to answer my prayer? Painful life blurs and losses might have us recently spinning out of control. But here's what can make a lasting difference. When we make that decision, it's a choice to fix our eyes on God and daily give him praise no matter what is staring us straight in the face. We suddenly realize that God has already begun to work things out in our favor. I was listening to your testimony, Mother Sumner, where you said you opened the bill and you looked at it and you started praising. God's working that out in your favor. It doesn't matter if we feel like it or not. Imagine if God blessed us according to how he felt. I don't feel like blessing Nancy today. Mm-mm, not today. She ain't gave me no praise for two days, so I ain't blessing her. It doesn't matter what we feel like. We're commanded to praise God. Amen? Amen. And we could do it through songs, meditation, through his word, of course. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But when we praise, our hearts get in tune with God. Amen? Amen. When we praise and worship God, we will experience a breakthrough in our lives. And anything that is unlike God will be removed so that our blessings will come through. When we praise and worship God, the walls of resistance will come down and we enter into the holy of holiness. We can tap into the promises of God in our lives. When we praise and worship, we demonstrate our faith God, I trust you, no matter what, in all our circumstances, all our situations. God, do it in your time. Hallelujah. Not our time, but your time. It's nice to have great singers, a praise team, and great musicians. However, I believe God is also looking for worshipers. In Psalm 34, 1, it says, I will bless the Lord. At all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So praise is an expression of faith and a declaration of victory. We believe God is with us and in control. So you speak those words and stand on God's promises. God doesn't lie. Stand on. I always say, don't pray the problem, pray the promise. We all have the problems, so let's stand on God's word. What does God's word say? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Are you going to believe the promise, or are you going to go into flesh? Look at God. Everything you need is in God's word. Everything. When we praise, we send that enemy running. I like that. The devil fears the name of Jesus. And this is why it's important to praise. Psalm 50, 23. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation, a right will I show the salvation of God. When God's people begin to praise, his name, as I said, it sends the enemy running. When God's people get together, what a time, what a time, what a time. Do you want to be released from your chains that have you bond? Do you want to put the enemy to flight? Amen? I know I do. So let's praise him in spite of. Praise him because he is God. He is worthy of the praise. Praise him for the battles he's already won for you. Hallelujah. If he did it once, he'll do it again. Praise God and make it a habit. Something you do, not just at church. When you praise God, in Psalm 150 it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. 
praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpets. Praise him with the sultry and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with string instrument and organs. Praise him upon the Lord's cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. In Psalm 100, it says, make a joyful noise. O ye lay and serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know you that God is good. Hallelujah. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name, for God is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth for all generations. So we see by this, through their praise and worship, the prisoners were freed. In uh, verse 29, it says, the jailer called for lights. They knew something had happened. Rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. I found this interesting because if you're free, the first thing you're going to do is run. Amen. It's true. But they came trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The jailers had the right spirit. They knew they needed salvation. They wanted salvation. How about you? How about you? So in conclusion here, tonight, if you're in a dark place, everything seems to look bleak. Are you in a place where all you see is doom and gloom? Are you in a place where you don't know which end is up? Are you desperate in a place where you have been praying and praying and you have not seen your breakthrough? God has not forgotten you. Remembers in his timing. You may feel you have no reason to pray, but pray anyway. Worship God. You may feel you're in a prison to your circumstances, your situations, and there is no way out. While God is here this evening, and I submit to shake your jailhouse. He's here to bring deliverance, to set you free. God is here tonight to open your prison doors and break through the shackles that hold you fast. And in doing so, others will see and be blessed as well. So let God tear down the strongholds in your life. But you must pray and praise and worship God. Praise and prayer equals victory. You know how it says push, pray until something happens? I like to say pray and praise until something happens. You may not have a suddenly moment. You might be praying and praying, but God has not forgotten you. He has not forgotten you. So in the midst of your circumstances, let's praise God. In the midst of your trials, let's praise God. In the midst of your darkest hour, let's praise God. In the midst of everything, let's commit to a lifestyle of praise. I just want everybody to stand on their feet. It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to do it. Amen? So let's saturate the atmosphere with praise. Hallelujah. Think about your dark hour. Think about your situation. Hallelujah. Think about where God has brought you through. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord. Think about it. Praise him, praise him, praise him. Let's worship God.
Let's worship God. Hallelujah, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Hallelujah. Your name is to be praised. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, you're worthy. We give you glory. We honor you tonight. You are omnipotent, Lord. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you. Thank you for using me as your vassal. We pray, Lord, that the, something that is sad, Lord Jesus, has fallen on fertile ground. A seed has been planted. Lord, I give it to you. You do what you want to do. I am your vassal, and I thank you for the opportunity to serve you. In Jesus' name I pray.